Okay, let's get started. I think people will trickle in. Um, so my name is Hannah Katz. Welcome everyone. I'm the Grants and Education Manager here at Giudine. Um, Giudine is the leading cultural institution dedicated to serving emerging and established artists through the collaborative creation of contemporary art using the process of hand paper making. Our programs include residencies, fellowships, and workspace opportunities for artists, on and off-site exhibitions, workshops and classes for all ages, and studio services. To access closed captions, please click on the closed captions button at the bottom of your screen. A captioned recording of this webinar will be posted online later this fall. Um, we'll save time at the end of the session for questions. Please use the Q&A function throughout the webinar to ask questions, um, and we will bring your questions back at the end. Um, I can't say that the chat will be moderated for questions, but we'll try to catch those too. But it's better to use the Q&A. Um, so I'm so happy to welcome these artists to speak to you today. Anela O oh is a multidisciplinary artist in love with curry and the ocean. She holds a BFA in studio art from the School of the Museum of Fine Arts at Tufts University. Her art practice is deeply grounded in a sense of community and sharing her skills with others through playful experimentation and collaboration. She uses materials that have a life of their own, such as clay, paper, and fiber to feed her studio practice and create environments full of color and texture. As a mixed race artist of Malaysian Chinese descent, she, uses a lot, she <clears throat> utilizes imagery, colors, textures, and smells from her cultural heritage to pay homage to the work of her ancestors as she builds new worlds and futures. Her work aims to inspire a sense of hope and proposes visions of a future that includes marginalized voices by choosing to take a joyful and playful approach while discussing immigrant histories. Her work has been exhibited across the United States at galleries and museums in California, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, and New York, among other places. She's been an artist in residence at Sonoma Ceramics and a teaching artist in residence at the Oxford School. <clears throat> in 2021-22, she was the West Bayview Fellow at Chittenay Paper Mill. She is currently the 2022-2023 resident at Aramount School of Arts and Crafts, where she's combining her love of materials in new and exciting ways. We are also joined by Amy Jacobs, our Senior Director of Artistic Projects and Master Collaborator at Judene. Amy received her MFA in, inter <clears throat> in Interdisciplinary Book and Paper Arts from Columbia College, Chicago, and studied for two years at Penland School of Craft as part of the Core Fellowship Program. Currently the co-director, sorry, currently the Senior Director of Artistic Projects and Master Collaborator. She has been a part of the Judene Studio Team since 2010. She has taught and led workshops at institutions, including Yale University, the Museum of Modern Art, the New York Public Library, the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, and the University of Georgia Studies Abroad Program in Cortona, Italy. Using a textile-based exploration of imagery, her own work embraces traditional and experimental papermaking techniques, as well as book arts and installation. Um, Anela, let's have the next slide, please. Um, I want to thank the West Bayview Foundation for their generous support of this fellowship. Amy, would you like to speak about the fellow fellowship? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Hannah. Um, I want to thank you all for coming today. It's really nice for it, for us to be able to do something like this and to hear Anela talk about her time as a fellow. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with, with the West Bayview Foundation Fellowship, it's a really wonderful opportunity for us to bring in um, a paper maker who is very serious and who is dedicated to the field, um, for them to come to Dudenay for six months, um, work alongside the, st the studio staff, really immerse themselves in our collaborative projects and to learn as much as they can about the techniques we use, um, Anela will talk a lot about the fellowship as she's giving her presentation. Um, I'd like to thank Joan Hall and Mark Weil. Without this, or without them, none of this would be possible. We're all very appreciative. Um, so thank you, Joan and Mark. And this was, Anela was our fourth fellow. Um, we just started our fifth fellowship. Her first day was yesterday. So it's very exciting that we, we have this program. And Anela, why don't you just start um, and talk about what you were doing before you came to Dudenay, some of your work and what led you to the fellowship. Yeah, thank you, Amy, for that introduction of the fellowship. It's so lovely after having left um, Dudenay several months ago to get to come back and reflect on this journey with all of you. So I'm going to click. Um, I came to Dunane. Um, my background was actually in interdisciplinary um, art. I went did my BFA at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts. 
um, which is now at Tufts University. And there I studied paper making under Michelle Samor, who is just an amazing human and really pushed all of us to think about how paper could be more than something you print on and how it could have a life of its own and really push sculptural qualities and how it re reacted to other materials. So this is an image from my BFA thesis exhibition where I was using ceramic sculptures, objects that also had poured avoca on top of them, as well as the background um, pieces are avoca that was also poured onto plastic. Um, I was really experimenting with how these materials that I was so tied to could really speak to each other. And so that led me to um, take a ceramics residency in Sonoma, California, which is a, what I was doing right before I came to Dudeme. Um, and that ended in a solo show, which you can see here. Um, these are a few images where I was really getting to dive deeper into what sort of conversation I wanted to have between ceramics, specifically as someone who was a ceramics resident at the moment and paper and how those things could interact. Um, and I was really drawn to ideas of transformation and thinking about my cultural background as Malaysian Chinese and how I could create these worlds that were multifaceted um, environments that spoke to multiple materials, um, making something stronger. Um, and so here I'm working with ceramic fragment as well as a 3D pen, which I'll talk about more because I use that a lot at Dudene as well as Kozo fiber and poured abaca sheets in the background. And then this was also from that solo show. And it was a series that I was thinking about a lot when I came to Dudene and the experimentations I was doing in the studio, because it was the first works I was actually utilizing Malaysian batik, which is a type of printed fabric and thinking about beadwork and thinking about the labor and honoring the people that have come before me and specifically people who've passed away in my life. Um, and my Acha, who is my great grandmother, had just passed away right before I started the residency in Sonoma. Um, and so I feel like that gave me the ability to start talking about my culture in a way that was completely different than before. And I brought that energy into the studio at Dudene. So, I mean, Amy can also talk a little about this, but my first day at Dudene, um, <laughs> there was a lot going on in the studio that week. Um, and I just sort of like dove into it. And I was so lucky that the first artist I worked with was Lena Puerta, who was one of the last people I saw before um, COVID and be because I was working still at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts and got to see her do a blowout demo. Um, which is a technique that we use a lot at Dudene. And I never got to try it because I saw the demo and then we went into <laughs> lockdown um, and then I didn't have facilities to really experiment with that. So my first day, Lena taught me how to do a blowout and I was able to help her experiment on works for what is our paper variable edition. Yeah, and let me just talk about um, that really quickly. Lena Puerta was a workspace resident I think back in 2016, and we invited her to um, be one of the artists alongside Nancy Cohen with our for our paper variable edition for 2022. And I knew from the beginning after seeing your work that it would be a nice fit for you to have the experience to work from the first day that Lena was in the studio while we were making tests all the way through the end where you actually were, you know, helping her sign all of the work. So. To me, it felt like it was a great opportunity um, to, to have you be a part of that whole whole experience. So, yeah, and she was literally the first person I worked with on my first day, and the person I worked with on my last day. Um, so it was also just really special to get to experience what it looked like to produce multiples in the studio. As someone who comes from a sculptural background, I tend to do something maybe in a series and then that's sort of it. I move on to another idea. And so learning how it works to work in handmade paper where things aren't going to be exactly the same, but to just still think about like an addition um, was really important to me um, and really amazing to get to do that with Lena. Um, so the finished work is on the right hand side. So here are some image and videos of the blowouts that we were doing that day. 
Um, reminder, this is my very first day at Do The Name, my first blowout that this video is of. Um, but we're using a stencil that acts as a resist on a sheet of paper and that's just been pulled. And with Lena, she also adds a lot of other materials. Um, she collects lots of used fabrics and also grocery packing materials. And so that's underneath. That's why you're seeing like sequins and sparkly stuff and using the hose, the blowout hose, we're just revealing what is underneath. Um, and everything except for what's covered by the stencil. So I'm gonna try and move forward. Um, and this is also for working with pulp paints. So we were working in lots of layers. So we're doing that process with the blowout and using the hose um, to reveal different sections of paper, but we were also, she was also then going back and using pulp paints um, to fill areas and using other stencils. So you're seeing the leaf plant form as well as the hand. And um, it was a really labor intensive uh, multi-step process um, to do an addition. Um, and that was really amazing to get to be a part of. And here, instead of using a stencil, we primarily use like a frosted mylar um, for all of these stencils for blowouts. She also used lace. And so this is Amy working with her um, on doing a blowout with the lace. So then you have a nice lace form on the sheet as well, which you can see here, which is her and I pulling it up <laughs> in the studio. And that was working on the final edition. I really just appreciated everything about working with Lena. I feel like she's one of my art aunties at this point. And she was someone who was a real inspiration to me before I came to Dudenay. Um, and we work very similarly. Like I think a lot about layering and I think a lot about color as well as relationship between people and nature and specifically food and food systems. So um, just there was so much learning outside of just the processes you're seeing in all the conversations we had um, in the studio. Here's an image of us curating the final edition. Um, so I helped her decide what she wanted to be a part of the edition. And then we finished placing um, googly eyes on the pieces after the fact. Um, so it was just like a phenomenal experience. And um, I really, really deeply appreciate all of the learning that I got from her. Um, I was also really lucky to work with a couple of the different workspace residents, um, and they were ones that had been supposed to come during COVID, correct, Amy? Yes, these were the, <laughs> sorry, the years have been a little mixed up. So I think, no. um, no. Yeah, they were with 20. Melissa Joseph is 2022. 2021. 2021. That's the correct year. So we were still working with our 2020 artist in 2021. So we had a lot of residents to work with. And um, Anela, you were really assisting me when Melissa came in most days, I think. We were making larger sheets. Um, so it takes two people to do that, which Anela is curating a freshly pulled sheet on the left there. Um, and then you were also like making all of the pulp paint. So you really, learned how to pigment really well. I know that you had been doing that before you came, but now you've you've got it. Yeah, done. but it was also different. Like Dunane as a professional studio versus having had access to whatever I created and then also a college studio is very different. Um, and pigmenting, the process of pigmenting for artists was um, completely wild to me because often um, there's a conversation and they pick out Pantone color swatches. So then you're actually trying to match almost exact colors in the studio, um, which when you're doing your own work, you're just sort of like, oh, that's good enough. That's sort of what I'm going for and you can go with it. And so this was a little more scientific in some ways. Um, and I really loved it. It was basically color problem solving. And you can see um, the pulp paints on the left. And this is also the setup for the studio before Melissa came in. So we pulled all of those 30 by 40 inch sheets and they're under felts and metals. Um, and then the test that I'm doing of all of the different colors I mixed for her is on the right. Anela, then, can you just, um, you don't have to talk about it a lot, but how did you feel, you know, cause collaborating with an artist is so different than 
in some ways you're teaching them how to do things, but you're really also helping them to kind of develop the ideas with the techniques. I think that at one point, you know, you work with the community a lot. So how did you feel about the collaborative process in general? Yeah, I think it helps that somehow like it was a grace that the people who came into the studio were people who work with very similar processes or ideas like Melissa comes from like a felting fibers background um, and was also talking in her work about being mixed race so like that that makes the collaboration much easier I feel like I was eased into it a little um and it was nice to feel like I had something to give as someone who's so young coming into this um professionally as an artist with working with amazing people like Lena and Melissa and I'll talk a little bit about Howard Dina but um these really amazing phenomenal artists to feel like oh I have something to give in this collaboration um and to get to learn and learn from them and how they reacted to the materials but also like get to work through their processes but Melissa was pretty much like we we did a little bit of that um that you can see here, we were doing some sculptural tests that she turned into these really, really beautiful forms. Um, and here she's wrapping abaca around rocks and then actually ended up using sandbags for a lot of the final pieces um, so that they were easier to get out because the abaca is so high shrinkage, it becomes really hard and that therefore is really hard to get off of forms. These were just encasing rocks. Um, but then she wanted to make some forms that were hollow to create these felted pieces. Um, but yeah, so I, I guess like Melissa was pretty independent in a lot of ways, but I feel like we had a lot of really um, important and um, beneficial conversations for both of us. Like I think collaboration doesn't end with like the back and forth around materials, but also about concept and like, how, how do you deal with coming in and going through all of these really emotional photos for, in like one day and um, just really having conversations about larger art practice in life. So, <laughs> I don't even know how to start with Howard Dina um, other than when Amy was like the first week that um, I had arrived in New York and was like, oh yeah, and we're working with Hardina Pendel for a whole, for the whole year. You'll definitely see her in the studio and work on this um, large project we're doing. I was like, what? <laughs> Who? Because <laughs> she's someone I, that's been a real inspiration to me. Um, and it was just incredible to, for the timing to work out that I was able to work on this large project. Um, and I don't know if Amy, you wanna talk a little more about like the relationship between Howard Dina and Dujanay? Yeah, sure. Um, so we're working in conjunction with Garth Green and Gallery and we were um, working over the course of a year to make work for a um, show with paperwork as well as paintings that opens um, September 15th of this year. So. If you want to go to that, I know Anela, you're probably going to come in town for the opening, which I is will be flying in. <laughs> Great. So Howard Dina um, did work in handmade paper back in the 70s and 80s. And so talking to her now, she said she always thought it would be a good fit to come back and work at Dudenay, which it definitely was. So we really looked at a lot of her older work for inspiration to help kind of conceive of new ways of working in paper for her. Um, you know, she's an older artist who's very established. Um, it was such an honor, I think, for all of us to be able to work with her in the studio and to help support her in making um, not only small work that she was kind of working on on her own when she came into the studio, but also really large pieces using our 40 by 60 inch mold and deckle um, to make larger work that she can no longer make herself. She works with a lot of um, dots as imagery and writing um, what she calls nonsense numbers. So she's handwriting on all of these dots and then bringing them back into the studio. As well as we um, worked with a letterpress printer and we had, um, we were also using um, etched 
paper that we would then punch out and die. And we're punching out all of these dots, I should say. Yeah. Just a lot. Yeah. So, um, a lot. At first, all by like one by one or like in small stacks until we found a machine that could punch through at least a thicker, thicker stack. It wasn't like extremely fast, but it at least relieved us of <laughs> some of the dot punching. Um, yeah. And Howard Dina's coming in. She was coming in once a week um, for a while. So we've made, you know, a lot of these smaller works and she's been able to help kind of guide us on the bigger works. Um, right. so we, made, we made quite a few. So we do like tests of things like the first image you were seeing and also this one we'd be we'd be testing some thoughts and she'd be in the studio and we'd be able to show them to her or we'd prepare them before she got there. Um, she was always working on a smaller piece that was actually physically doable for her um, to be doing the laborious placing of, of dots on. Um, and so it was like really amazing to see that back and forth and the testing and like her decision making um, because it really was um, her input that created these pieces even though we were doing most of the like physical making especially of the larger pieces. Um, but this was like one of the tests that I got to be a part of because um, I was there when we were really starting the tests for the large works, um, which I think is amazing that I got to follow through um, with a few of those big projects. Um, so this is a piece that derived from um, the tests that I was showing you. And this is 40 inches by 60 inches. So it's actually really large, um, which you can't tell scale in a photo, but it's a lot of dots. Speaking of 40 by 60, this is how Amy and I um, pulled the base sheet for that piece and also um, all of these larger 40 by 60 works were done in a decal box and I am very short um, so it was a little bit more of a challenge for us to get the sheet to be even um, with how much shorter I am um, but it was something that like I never had experienced before was working with the decal box on this scale and really having to work as a team to make large work um, and that really inspired me for the work that I ended up doing for my West Bay V days. And so this is just following through a process of one of the larger works we did for Howardina. Here we're laying string down on a base sheet and then placing dots, all of these very tiny dots. What was the final count? Do you remember of like one of those pieces? It was like 70,000? 16, 1600 or something. It was, it was something ridiculous. It, it was, was in the thousands, <laughs> definitely. Um, my brain is so locked about how many there were because it just like all they all blended into each other but it was really beautiful um often despite this photo we were all working as a crew and like sitting around and getting to talk um while placing dots um and then all of those works the large works went into the drying system and each of these boxes is 25 pounds on top of it so it like just to give you a sense of the labor and energy that went into all of these pieces um, often you're loading things at the very end of the day as well. And this was us pulling one of those dot placed string pieces um, when it had just come out of the drying box. And this is another one of the works that I worked on um, like based off of those original tests that I was showing. And it happens to be one of my favorite that came out of this just because of um, the fact that once we made the squares um, and placed them, like all of them were drawn on by Ordina. Um, and so there is this element of her like actually handwriting into them. Um, and then some that were sprinkled in that we've helped fill in so that there was this amount, um, this quantity. And I feel like the movement of this piece is just really beautiful. Um, but it was wonderful to get to like produce a lot um, and then <laughs> send them home with her and to like receive them and for it to go back and forth on one of the larger works. So that was very special. And um also I got to work with Nancy Cohen a little in the studio which was a completely different experience than um working with workspace artists because she was also part of that paper variable edition um that Lena was doing but also Nancy just has this really long history with Dudenay 
um, and is just an amazing paper maker in her own right. And so it was just a lot of fun to get to see what she was thinking about and like the different ways she was making. And I think I took a lot of that energy um, into my own studio days as well. But once again, doing more blowouts. Um, I'd never done a blowout before I came to Dudenay and I ended up doing so many um, and I love it. Um, it's a process I really adore. So I think that's really, really special that I got to work with so many people like that. Um, you, also, you also learned a different drying technique with this. Yeah. That you ended up using a lot with the cloths, so. Yeah, so like you can see in these, finished pieces um, from Nancy for the edition, um, that there's a lot more movement in them. And that's because of a drying method that I think Paul Wong came up with, or like that's that's what it's been sort of attributed to, um, but where you use cloths to dry the work. So you press them, go ahead and press them, and then you handle them what, when they've only been pressed and put them on um the cloths and then cover them and put a heavy heavy sheet of metal on top so then there's still movement but these fibers like especially abaca like there's so much shrinkage they want to roll up into a potato chip if you let them completely air dry um so this allows for some movement but like being partially restrained in that process which i used um in different points in the studio myself I also got to see a lot of shows because I was in New York, as well as eat a lot of good food. Um, I really appreciated those opportunities. Um, and one of the like most impactful ones was getting to see like a full show of Ruth Asawa's work. Um, she was someone that I, an artist that I'd always like call it a pilgrimage. Like I'd go to the one at SF MoMA or I'd like go see the, the one here, one in LA when there was a show there. Um, but getting to just be in a full space and thinking a lot about environments, but also being interdisciplinary. I hadn't seen so much of her work that wasn't the like ones that are so iconic of the wire, wire weaving, um, but also like her works on paper. And I found the watermelon piece. I, I just was obsessed with this piece. And um, it reminded me a lot of that sort of blowout technique on abaca and um, cloth drying because of all of the movement in it. Um, and plain, so that was very exciting to me. And then another project, because there were many projects, there are always so many projects going on at Dudenay. You may hear about only some of them because they're often like longer term and there are things happening behind the scenes all the time. Um, it was always very busy. Um, but these are uh, hearts, handmade paper hearts for Love Positive Women. And this is a relationship that's been a project that's been going on for a couple of years um, and used to be pre-COVID um, in person. And so I'm the second fellow, Catherine worked on these um, the year previous where you're producing. Um, so we produced all of these handmade paper sheets. I think it was like 700 total and they all had some pulp paint um, and then they were sent off to artists to decorate. And these were for HIV positive women. Um, part of the process that was really amazing to me about this, um, even before they reached the point that they were interacting with um, like the public and the community and being these amazing things is also there were a lot of new team members at Do Today that came on right after me. And so um, they were doing their first days in the studio. And often the way I, they were pulling their first sheets, like Nick here was doing these hearts um, and helping me like move through these. And also some of our amazing interns definitely produced a lot. So that was just a wonderful piece of getting to share and also like see people who are primarily in the office get to make paper with me. And for LPW, the Love Positive Women Pro Project this year, um, it was shown in MoMA PS1, which was really special to get to see the decorated hearts. So these have already been sent to artists and the artists worked on them. So they're all individually decorated um, and then installed. And all of us as staff at Do Today worked on a few as well. So it was just very special and very, I went to the opening, got to meet a lot of people and um, just see all of the joy that this project brings to the community. 
here I am there. <laughs> and you can see a little bit more of some of the decorations on them. I don't know if Amy, you have anything else to say about LPW. No, it's it's one of our most favorite programs and hopefully we'll be able to do it um, back in person again. But this this really worked very well. It enabled us to keep um, keep going with with the um, it, it's such a, a magical thing. To, and they're all over the world. We send these um, all over the world to women that are HIV plus. And I know that it means a lot. So, yeah, thanks for working on that. It's a lot of work. It's so much fun. Yeah. And um, along with that, I was doing my own work in the studios like almost every weekend. I was in there at least every other weekend. Um, so this is my drawer at some point um, full of all these different tests. I started out doing a lot of tests with knitting and just getting a better sense of what blowouts could mean to my practice. Um, and I was just like really hoping to like work with the knit forms that I've been thinking about because I came from somewhere that was like very ceramics heavy and I was like okay but I work with all these other materials what is their relationship with paper as well can I loop back on like building stronger relationships between all of my materials so I was dragging knitting through abaca and pulp painting on them and drying them um and also like putting them in the press and so I could make these debossed forms and pouring across those. So there was just a lot of different sorts of material tests I was doing um, with knitting as well as with the 3D pen. Um, I use a 3D Doodler Pro and so it basically it works as a glorified hot glue gun and it extrudes plastic and you can draw with it. And I'm really in love with that process as also a reference to like batik because it's a wax resist um, fabric process. So I think it really speaks back and forth. Um, so I was doing a lot of those tests, um, as well as just continuing to work with those blowout forms and sort of came to a point that I was making these pieces um, that like utilize both blowouts and also some pulp painting um, and working with stencils in a way that I hadn't before. Um, and in the middle of all of that, as I was working on these projects, I also um, was um, juried into the hand paper making portfolio called the language of color, which is now available for pre order um, on the hand paper making website. And so I worked on an edition of 125 which really meant that I did like 140 pieces in the studio. Um, and that was definitely like, I took all of that learning from working with Lena on the edition, but also just all of the, and also LPW working on all of those hearts to create some pieces um, for that portfolio, which is a curated portfolio of multiple artists. So I'm really excited to see what the other artists have done. Um, Catherine Latimer, who's one of the collaborators at Dunane now, um, also was a part of that portfolio. So it's very exciting and um, here's, a time lapse of me working on all of these sheets um, and I'm doing a method where I'm pouring the pulp paint across stencils so I can get really bright colorful translucent washes. So now I'm going to try and move us forward. Um, I also went to Interlochen Arts Academy as a high schooler, which is an arts boarding high school. And a lot of my people from there um, happened to end up in New York City. So one of my closest friends, Mae Stone, um, studies broke flute and at Juilliard and so we decided to work on some collaborations and um, we'll be posting if you keep a, keep an eye on me um, we'll be posting like a short documentary um, about what it meant to collaborate between music and um, paper which I think was really really meaningful to me so here's sort of like all of the different pieces as I was preparing for my West Bayview days. So you can sort of see the meeting of the portfolio getting curated, as well as some of the tests I was doing. I was doing a few sculptural tests. And I also just set up um, while things were drying or while I was beating fiber and was doing my 3D doodling with the pen um, on the tables there. So this well, let me let me break in really quickly. So the the West Bayview Fellow, when they come in, we're really there to help support them, you, um, to make 
uh, your own work and to also to make a body of work, but you also have these four professional days um, with a collaborator with me or Tatiana. I think your first two days were with Tatiana, the second two are with me. Um, so we're really there to support that. You're coming in just like any other artist, like a resident for those professional days. And it's a way for us to um, help kind of develop more um, kind of intricate ideas or an extra set of hands if we're working bigger. So yeah, just to, to kind of give you a feel for when you say professional days. Yeah, that. thank you, Amy, for clarifying that. Yeah, I would, and it was amazing because I got to see all these artists take advantage of their days in different ways in the studio. So I had a better sense of like, oh, what projects is it useful to have extra hands on or other collaborators on? And um, how can I prepare for those days best? Um, so I spent a lot of time prepping materials. I was beading fiber, or pigmenting, and also um, doing a lot of 3D doodling for a larger work that I will show. But like when I was talking about how the 3D pen speaks to Malaysian batik, um, I was thinking specifically, these are some images of sarongs and Nonya Kabaya. I'm currently wearing a sort of like modern modern day kabaya um, technique, but um, yeah, so it's very important to me to utilize the colors, the textures, the sort of motifs um, from my cultural history and my background and think about like how much these patterns and colors influence um, my, the way that I move through the world and how I can reclaim spaces. So while I was at Dudene, um, I talked a lot about being Malaysian Chinese, um, but I'm also mixed race. And it was the first time that I sat down and was really thinking about how do I want to talk about my other half, which I think in some ways is more difficult for me to talk about um, because my grandmother grew up as a sharecropper in South Carolina. And so there's intense poverty um, and also just a lot of love and labor and work um, of people who are still living. Um, so I've always been a little like, I don't know how to talk about this. I think people expect my um, a lot of where I come from to come from, oh, it's the immigrant story. Oh, it's this trauma from that. I'm like, but I'm only like my grandmother grew up as a sharecropper um, on the white half of my family. So I really wanted to start honoring and thinking about that. And okra is a huge part of what it looks like um, to be a farmer in any form in the South. Um, and it was really important to my family there, but it also shows up a lot in Malaysian cuisine. It came via India. Um, there's a really large Indian population in Malaysia. And um, so it's in a lot of our food um, from all of these different places. And also it um, has these flowers because it's in the hibiscus family um, that look like they belong on batik. Um, and there even is hibiscus um, batik specifically. So I was like, oh, this is, this is a natural way for me to start talking about this and talking about my family um, in a more holistic way. And so these are from my first set of professional days with Tatiana. Um, where we did a avoca base sheet um, that was 30 by 40 inches round. And then we did stenciled pulp paint and that's the okra with the um, okra flowers that's on top of that. And then I also felt like it was really important to add thread um, because that side of my family, both of my great grandmothers um, were seamstresses in different ways. And so sewing and thread is really important to me um, and also just the makers of my family and honoring them um, and thinking about their spirits being in the studio with me. So here's one of the blowouts that I did um, with Tatiana. So we had the base sheet, the stencil pulp paint, then we had the thread and then Tatiana and I um, did all of these blowouts for every single piece. I think it was, six 30 by 40 blowouts that day, um, which is a lot if you think about the labor of two people having to blow away all of this material. Um, and those are hand cut stencils. Did you hand, they are hand cut. They are hand cut stencils, yeah. I, I sat down with a podcast and just <laughs> did a lot of hand cutting of mylar. Um, so then it was sort of leaf, my own leaf batik forms. 
And those were cooched on top of that top sheet, as you can see here. Um, I also worked through lots of layers. Um, I also worked with Abaca um, that I put into the squeeze bottles and worked with that on top of it. So you can see that as like the sort of salmon-y color floral forms on the top of this piece. Um, that day, because we were already doing blowouts, one of the little experiments that I'd done that I'd enjoyed was a poured piece where you don't form the sheet itself. And that was something I learned from Nancy. Like I saw her um, scraping away sections and pouring in um, just the abaca onto the pelon, um, which is that interfacing that everything in the wet studio is put on top of. And so this is just a poured sheet and then a blowout and also 3D doodles that I was dipping in abaca. And you can see the chaos of all of the different colors. And what I'd like to say also, like I was pigmenting some of this for myself, but also I was using a lot of leftovers um, because a lot of the artists we worked with in the studio had used really bright colors um, and things that were already in my palette. And I really appreciated that. And then my second set of days was with Amy and we went more like, I wanted to do like a full series that was based off of tests that I felt like had become complete pieces on the first two days. And then I wanted to do something that was more experimental um, and really large scale that I couldn't have done on my own. And so here we pulled a 40 by 60 inch base sheet like that video I showed earlier of Amy and I with the decal box. And then all of those 3D doodles that I prepped were dipped into abaca, so it was an eight hour abaca, also very high shrinkage, and placed on top of the sheet with thread. And then we scooped away, and you can sort of see on the right hand side, scooped away any anything that wasn't the 3D doodles overlapping. So basically made my own lace work environment out of that. <coughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so, and then the other two days, we were doing these sort of forms based off of what Melissa had also been experimenting with in the studio and thinking about larger vessel forms, also with blowouts. So I worked a lot with Amy on these poured forms where I poured onto the mold not, and then we cooched it onto that sheet. So that's what we're doing in the left-hand side. Um, and then those were pressed. Those each got a blowout and then they were pressed and I could form them around plastic as you see in the center there. And I don't know, Amy, if you have any thoughts about what it was like to work with me in the studio then. Um, it was definitely intense a um, couple of days and a little more experimental. But Yeah, but I knew it would work. So <laughs> I wasn't worried. I'm glad you did, yeah. yeah. I knew it would. I understood what you were going for. So um, it was just, you know, technically you know, holding up those big sheets of paper to wrap around plastic was a little tricky, but you made it work. And I yeah. love how you installed them when you had all of them at the end, so. Right, and here they are, um, they're on the back wall and I installed them with lights behind them. Um, I was really grateful that at the end of my time at Judene, um, there was, I got to have a small solo show in the space with the work that I've been doing um, in those professional days, but also just the experiments I've been doing on my own. So this is the some of the final imagery of those pieces that I was showing initially. And this is what they look like dry. And there's a lot of movement because of the abaca um, in relationship with the blowouts because the blowouts are made out of short cotton. Um, and so they shrink less than the abaca does. And those were really that that sort of quality in the movement was really important to me. Here's a detail of those works. And you can here you can sort of see the like hibiscus butti motifs underneath and sometimes an okra popping through um, as well as the, the thread relationship with the abaca. I feel really strongly about these pieces. They mean a lot to me, um, which is also why I named them after my granny Ken Ken, who is my great grandmother on my mater my maternal grandmother's side. 
And here is the um, what those pieces I worked with with Amy um, looked like installed and dry. Um, there's a lot of shrinkage and changing of colors, um, but also it's just really amazing these sculptural properties of Africa, which is something I'm thinking about now, be, being at Aramont and having access to ceramics and studios again. This is that large 40 by 60 3D doodled piece thread. I'm also like thinking like obviously taking all of the energy that I had in those last couple of days and learning I have a Dudonne back into a studio where I have more access to different types of materials. Here we are. So this is where I'm at now. <laughs> I'm at Aramont School of Arts and Crafts in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. There are lots of bears. I ran into one just walking after dinner last night as well. Um, but also I have a really beautiful private studio um, and I'm trying to figure out a setup that works well for me to really be incorporating paper making in meaningful ways into my practice. I have my own valley beater, which I'm still figuring out, um, but I'm really investing in studio, all the aspects of studio that I need and tools um, to really bring the learning that I did in Dudonay. Um, into my practice in a way that it doesn't just stop because I don't have access to a professional studio anymore. I'm like, okay, what are the ways that I can keep making um, and keep experimenting? So I've been doing a lot of like ceramic meets paper and fiber experiments um, as well as taking those 3D doodle forms and lacing them through ceramic forms and thinking more about this hard and soft relationship um, between these two materials and that's what we have for you. <laughs> well, Anela, it was such a joy to work with you. I know we all love it. <laughs> it was really great to see you take advantage of the fellowship. I know you you lived close to Dudene, so it was easy for you to walk down even when we had a lot of snow. <laughs> you were able to come <laughs> And yeah, snow days when no one was there, I was there. Yeah, which is <laughs> nice. So you were able to come in, um, you know, a lot of the weekends and to just see you grow from the beginning to the end and what you did was really, was really amazing. And then to see you carrying on, um, you know, continuing to work in paper, that you have your own beater. It just shows, <laughs> you, it just shows how serious you are about the field. And I think you're really um, contributing a lot to it, so. Thank you. Yeah, I just, I also want to say that working at Dudonay in this fellowship is like one of the most supported moments I felt. Like I felt like there was so much learning, but also there was like emotional caring support from always and institutional support um, in the form of the award as well as um, just Dudonay and everyone in the office. So it really felt like a family and I do miss it a lot, um, but I'm very happy to be where I'm at now. So now we're going to open it up to questions. Um, so please use the Q&A. We already have a couple in there, but please add your questions. Um, and we can start with the first question. Um, Anela, what inspired you to go into this form of art? Which I think means paper making. Yeah, I think really, because I went to an arts boarding high school, so I'd been working with lots of materials and I was sort of disillusioned by the time I got to my um, undergrad because I had had my own thesis show in high school. I'd been really thinking conceptually and then I was like, oh, um, like I don't feel like I have a community because people like were just starting to experiment and figure things out. And I was like, okay, what will get me excited again. Like what will make me excited about making things again? Um, and that's when I met Michelle, like I had her for a um, review board, I think my first semester. And she's like, oh, you need to be working in paper, Nayla. She's like, you have to take my class, um, get into it as soon as you can. And she was totally right because I think the possibilities are endless with paper and it's not something that you come to with a lot of preconceived notions about what it can do um, or what it can be when you're thinking about like art um, and not just it is a sheet of paper that we interact with all the time. So I was, I just loved getting my hands back into a material that made me play again. Um, maybe in a similar way about how the different materials you work in work together. There's a question. 
How did this layering that happened in the wet studio affect how you think about layer and order in your ceramic practice? Oh, I love that. I see that's from Anna. Thank you, previous West Bay View Fellow for the amazing question. Um, I think right now I'm definitely thinking about it a lot. It's definitely everything's shifting. Like I think I took my learning from ceramic and layering and ceramic into the wet studio. Like when I was talking about those large circular forms, those were forms where I like built structures, like built ceramic lacework structures. And then I like did multiple processes with those. And I think I sort of worked in reverse in the paper studio. And now I'm trying to figure out what that looks like to me and I'm leaning more towards weaving things and sort of going in between like the things that you can't really do in either material alone um but that like what is actually the strengths of them so building ceramic structures that then like can shatter or whatever and then weaving 3d doodles or paper through them and then continuing to work off of it and build layers but definitely um just realizing how many things I could work with wet um, is going to affect like how I now interact with these different mediums, if that answers the question. <laughs> um, there's another question about your decision to make the blowout circular. Oh, yeah, um, that was mainly in reference to the, I was thinking about what was really successful to me in those, in my um, solo show in Sonoma. And I, I got a lot of feedback on those labor of ornament pieces that they were like portals, that they were like windows, like sort of like porthole windows into a different world. And I really liked that um, as this sort of like, oh, you're entering a new space, even without it having to be like a full installation. I'm often thinking about how can you immerse someone in, in a piece without having to make a full installation all the time. Um, so we're on our last question. People feel free to keep adding them. We have a couple more minutes. Do you have any upcoming show, <clears throat> any upcoming shows? And do you have any upcoming classes that you will be teaching? I do. Well, we're doing up like me and the other artists in residence here. We're a cohort of five people. We're doing a pop-up show in Knoxville at Able Trade on this Friday. That'll just be for first Fridays, but then we'll have a show in November that's in Knoxville um and that'll be all of us and it'll be a lot more work and we get to curate that as well I'm also currently in um a show at Pyramid Atlantic called Looks Good on Paper and so that's in the DC area and that's a full paper show so that it would be really fun if anyone has the ability to go see it if you haven't already seen it um as well as I'm gonna have one of those ceramic pieces in a show in um at Baltimore Clayworks this fall um and I'm assuming people can find out more about all those opportunities on your Instagram yes. which is <laughs> at turmeric and clay and your website um, we have a couple more great questions that I want to get to um after working at a scale that requires multiple hands do you feel restricted having to scale back down to things that you can make by yourself um, a little, but also I only really got to work with multiple people for those four professional days in the studio. Like those were the only days that it was a lot of us um, working on my particular work. So most of the time at Dudene, I was actually working smaller. If I was working larger, it was me struggling in the studio to make things work on the weekends. Um, I honestly appreciate it in some ways because I, I, as a, an artist, my practice, I feel like it's really important for me after a big moment like this to take a step back and not just continue producing work along the same line, but be like, oh, how can I consider um, where my practice needs to go now with the opportunity that I have? And it could have been really easy to just keep making the work if I'd had access. <laughs> um, so now I'm having to rethink and like play again and experiment again, which is obviously a struggle in its own right um but I um think I'm better off for it in the long run <laughs> I think that's it for questions Amy do you have anything you'd like to add or highlight no I think what I said before it was really great um to have a nail in the studio um I think that the 
West Bayview Foundation Fellowship is such a great opportunity. Um, I encourage people to look into it. And um, I think that, I don't know, Anela, you were kind of, well, every West Bay View fellow that we've had, I don't know how many are watching, have been pretty perfect in their own way <laughs> going towards this. But it was nice to see, I think, you really did take advantage of coming in every weekend and you know working so much on your own work and test um, that, yeah, we were all, all very proud of you. And it's been so great seeing what you're doing now and that you have this chance for a residency program that allows you to keep experimenting. So thank you. Yeah. 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 No. And I, I just want to say as well, um, that it was just this, this fellowship is like no other opportunities available. Um, <laughs> you know, like the ability to come in and to like, it's this combination of getting to really learn and learn things that are meaningful. It's not like you're sitting there at like, I mean, yes, there were moments where we were just sitting there punching dots, but like there was also all of this other learning happening and everyone like you and Tatiana made it a real effort to make sure that I was involved in um, projects that would mean something to me in my practice. Um, so the fact that I was getting to go back and forth between learning and making, um, was just it was amazing and I feel like it it's why it was possible for me to be coming in almost all the time on the weekends because I was like oh, I have so many things that I learned this week <laughs> um so much was going on I want to test all of these different things with that um so it was a really generative experience um and I'm so grateful for all of you so another question came in that I think is very relevant at how to apply there will be an open call later this fall um, the best way to find out about it is to follow us on Instagram and subscribe to our newsletter, which you can do at the bottom of the homepage of our website. And if you have any issues, you can email us at jimne at jimne.org. Um, we are rapidly approaching 1 p.m. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I want to thank everyone who came. I hope that you enjoyed this talk. We really appreciate your um, attention and thoughtful questions. Um, and we hope that you keep in touch with us, keep in touch with Anela, follow the amazing things she goes on to create and exhibit and speak about. Um, Anela, what's your website? <laughs> um, it's just my first name dot my last name dot com. So it's Anela dot O or there's not a dot, Anela O dot com. I'm like, that's my email. I will put it uh, which you are also email. welcome to email me. <laughs> and that is also on my website, um, but it's Anela O dot com. And your Instagram handle is turmeric and clay. And if you want to yeah. follow Judene, it's at Judene Paper on Instagram. Um, so I'm going to end the webinar now. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye.